All right, grab your Bibles now and turn to Philippians chapter number 2. Okay, I invite you back tonight for our study of the book of Exodus as we begin looking at the plagues. We start at 6 o'clock, and as was previously said, we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper tonight as well. If, Paul writes in verse number 1 of chapter 2 of this letter to the church at Philippi, if, if there be therefore any consolation or encouragement in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels or affections and mercies. Paul says, fulfill ye my joy. How? That you may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. To the church at Philippi, let nothing be done through strife, or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also, also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but instead he makes himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in likeness of man and being found in fashion as man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross therefore God also hath highly exalted him given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow and every tongue confess. In verse 11. And then he's in particular in verse 10. Uh, Things in heaven, things on the earth, things under the earth, as though we should think anyone's going to be excluded. Every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord. And this confession that Jesus is Lord will be to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Lord, grant to us your presence through the power of the Holy Spirit. May you be glorified in everything that happens in the next hour or so as we preach your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul tells us in verse 1 four things that he expects are present at the church at Philippi. Four things that he expects are present. Four things that you are in fact experiencing. Four things that he is confident is there. It's almost as though he's saying, if this is there, and of course it is. If this is here, and I know it is. If you're experiencing this, and of course you have, that's his idea. And the four things are presented to us in the ESV as, uh, uh, the ESV rendering as encouragement and comfort and participation and affection. And oh, by the way, may I emphasize to you one more time that the reason you experience these things is because you're part of the church. That you don't experience these things sitting at home. You don't experience the affection of the church or the encouragement that comes from being in Christ or the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. These things are found in the local New Testament church. That our participation in the church is how we often will experience these things. This encouragement, this comfort that comes from being in the love of Christ, this fellowship of the presence of the Holy Spirit, and the experience of affection and mercies is what Paul is expecting to be at the church at Philippi. And then he transitions to this idea of complete my joy. Verse number two, fulfill ye my joy. So what is Paul saying here? I'm presently in a prison in Philippi. I mean in Rome, writing to the church at Philippi. And I want some more joy. 
I want some joy. I want to experience joy. I want to experience delight. I want to experience happiness. And I'm going to experience that, Paul says, through your, verse number two, your like-mindedness, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. So let's ask, what is joy? Well, joy is an emotion evoked by good success, victory, or well-being. It's happiness or delight. Some of you experience, unfortunately, more joy from a football team winning than the body of Christ. And I would say very loudly and clearly, shame on you. That's unfortunate. Uh, We are to experience our joy first and foremost through the Lord. Through those things that are pleasing to the Lord. Paul is seeking joy and he's seeking it through knowledge of what's happening in the local New Testament church at Philippi. Paul wants more joy, and there's nothing wrong with wanting more joy. God created us as beings that enjoy being joyful. That joy is a good thing. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. That rejoice is rejoined experiencing joy. In other words, love experiencing joy. Being joyful is a good thing. Jesus Christ said that he looked, uh, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who... Who, for the joy set before him, went to the cross. In other words, Jesus knew what was on the other side of the cross. And on the other side of the cross was incredible joy. So I will go to the cross in anticipation of this what? Joy. If I said to you two lovebirds right here, soon to be married eventually... You have a date yet, or are you still working on that? You do? You actually have a date? All right, good stuff. You want to share it, or is it kind of a private thing? All right, what is it? November 11th. Next month. Wow. They're not messing around, Bob. I mean, last week they announced their engagement, and this week they're announcing November 11th. Well, congratulations. So I said to you, your, your marriage is going to be absolutely, positively miserable. Would you like to get married? No, no. The reason you get married is because you are anticipating what? Joy. Joy. That's why you get married. Some of you are looking at me, not my marriage. That's not my problem. That's yours, okay? (laughs) You fix that, all right? But but we, we do something. We engage in this thing called marriage because we believe that with this person, we will experience joy. This is going to be a great delight. I'm trying to help you understand that the Apostle Paul is motivated to experience joy. I'm writing to you so that I, when I hear about what you're doing over there, will experience joy. The Apostle John did the same thing. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, all three of them talk about joy. 1 John 1, 4, And these things write unto you that your joy may be full. 2 John 12, Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come to you face to face and speak that our joy may be... I'm going to come make a visit to you. I'm going to come make a visit. And I am anticipating that in that visit, we're going to have a joyous time. Hey folks, we don't do well to the testimony of Christ if we're not joyous people. We ought to enjoy life. We ought to enjoy being with each other. We ought to enjoy coming into the body of Christ. Look, if you enjoy raising your hands, raise them. Don't you worry one bit about it. If you enjoy clapping, clap. You're supposed to experience the joy of the Lord in this place. It's not supposed to be like coming to a funeral. And even our funerals are supposed to be different because absent from the body is present with the Lord. Right. And then... Uh, 3 John 4 tells us, I, John says, have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And folks, this is where we need to be. If, If your children can sense through you that you get more joy out of a hit in a ball game or an A on a test than learning God's Word or participating in a worship service, or anything that would communicate some level of spirituality, if you get more joy out of those things, you are clearly communicating the wrong message. 
And you might not even realize that you're communicating the wrong message. You might even not recognize the fact that you get more excited about, you got him out on second base? That was an amazing play. We had this conversation in Sunday school. Oh, yeah, let's talk about it later. And, and what are you, dads, what are you indirectly communicating? Well, that's important. And, and, and i got to tell you about my son who scored. Okay. What about the things of God? What about walking in the truth? No greater joy than I have than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Why? Why is this such a big deal? Because we know that walking in the truth is evidence of what? It's salvation, authentic salvation. Every one of us in the back of our minds, even those churches that teach, pray a prayer and you get saved, even those churches know, man, I'm so uncomfortable because he's not giving me any evidence. She's not showing me anything that gives me any evidence they have a walk with the Lord. And they're not experiencing an ounce of joy. But man, when you begin to see the evidences of grace being manifested in the lives of your children, you're like, glory to God. There's a light in there. Maybe the Holy Spirit is present. And those things bring to us joy. They bring to us joy. So Paul says, I want you to complete my joy. I want you to complete my joy. Fulfill ye my joy by being like-minded having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Ultimately, Paul's looking for unity in the church. He wants the church unified in their purpose and in their mission and in their vision. The church is supposed to be unified. So why? Why the big deal, Paul? Why are you so concerned about unity in the body of Christ? Well, turn over to John 17. Hold your place in Philippians because we're coming right back. But turn over to that fourth gospel, John 17, and let's look at why Paul is so concerned about unity in the body of Christ. And this would be a good verse for you to underline and mark in your Bible, and I trust you do that. And the reason this would be such a good verse for you to mark and, and, uh, and underline in your Bible It's because this is the Lord Jesus Christ praying to the Father. This is what really is the Lord's Prayer in your Bible. We often call our Father who art in heaven the Lord's Prayer, but in reality that's the model prayer. And this in John 17 is the Lord's intercessory prayer. He's praying on behalf of you. That's an amazing thing, praying on behalf of you, Josh, knowing that you're going to come to Christ and praying on your behalf. And so in verse number 23, and I have it in the NASB up on the screen for you because it's just an excellent rendering. In verse 23, I in them and thou in me. So Jesus is talking about the perfect unity that they have. And now he says, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. So now he prays, I want the church to have the same unity that I have with you, Father, and that you have with me. Now, to what end? Why? Why does the Lord pray for the unity of the body of Christ? The word that serves as a function word there in verse 23 to show us why the Lord Jesus Christ is praying for the unity of the church. That, underline in your Bible, the world may know that thou hast sent me. Who is Jesus? Is he an imposter? Is he a fraud? Is he a a, a narcissistic, egotistical, self-absorbed being who creates this legend so he has followers? Is that who he is? Is he a creation of the apostles? Is he a liar? Is he a lunatic? Is he a legend? Who is he? He says, I am praying that the church would be unified, perfectly united as one, so that the world would know there is a God in heaven who sent his son. Who sent his son. Who sent his son. The greater degree, moms and dads, the greater degree, husbands, uh, wives, the greater degree that which you are unified in the house. The greater degree to which you are unified is the greater degree that you're witness to your children as to the authenticity of what you believe. So 
take that very idea. All right, uh, 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 let's see, just a Buddhist marries a Christian. How, how, how united are they going to be in that house as to the absolute truth that God the Father sent the Son? They're not going to be united. They're going to be divided. So now the children grow up in a house that's divided over who Jesus is, and they get to choose whatever they want. Take that micro picture and apply it to us as a church. Us as a church. The greater or lesser degree to which you, we are united as a church communicates to the world that comes in. They really believe what they're singing about. They really believe what they're teaching. I walked into that assembly and it was different. Everyone was singing. People said hello to me. There's something different about that. Say it, church. Something different about that church. But wait a minute, it's not just, let's go back to our verse, it's not just that God the Father sent the Son, He doesn't end it there. The verse doesn't stop there. And, He wants them to know, and that God the Father loves them. He loves them. He loves them. So not only, not only do we see in this prayer for the unity of the body of Christ, the affirmation as to the authenticity that there is a God in heaven who sent His Son, but the reason He sent His Son is because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son so that we could be rescued out of our alienation from God, that is, our sins would be forgiven. We'd be granted eternal life. And what is the motive? What is the motive? What is the motive behind God sending His Son? Love. And that should bring you incredible encouragement this morning. Because life is hard in this fallen world. It's, it just stinks. Four soldiers in our command on our installation out here. Four soldiers just ambushed and violently executed and and dad's dead and golly life stinks and there are no easy answers there are no easy answers and i need to know that there's something more there is Amen. there's a god in heaven that loves you Amen. he loves you I mean, He loves you. How much does He love me? He loves me so much that He sent His Son. How much does the Son love you? That He left heaven to die for you. For you. And so, so Paul is praying for the unity of the church because he knows, he knows that the unity of the church confirms the authenticity of the message. Think about just something as simple as a worship song in Christ alone. And I trust that nearly every one of you were singing that song because it's a beautiful, amazing song. In fact, let me just be kind of rude right now and a little stepping on your toes. If you don't enjoy that song, I'm not sure you're saved. Because the lyrics are too good. Just too good. Too authentic. Too genuine. Too sincere. Too spot on, too biblical. And so, how in the world would it look to an unbelieving church that is a visitor coming in here? You follow me? And only this side is singing the song. And we're completely divided as a church because we don't all agree that it is, in fact, Christ alone. And so you guys aren't singing a thing whatsoever. I mean, you can actually notice, let me tell, these are our guests here this morning. And they notice, wow, we're on the side that's singing. And these folks aren't even singing. Isn't that odd that they're not singing? I wonder if they believe what this side believes. In fact, I wonder what this church believes because only some of them are singing. You see where I'm going with that? But the greater degree to which we are united, that is the greater degree to which we all collectively believe, it is Christ and Christ alone. And so we are all collectively proclaiming this truth in unison. We don't even have to be in harmony. Okay? 
All right? It's a beautiful thing, and I love it when it happens. Not that I could tell the difference, but, but it's supposed to be a good thing. But the loud proclamation of the truth in a unified way communicates so much. Uh, sidebar illustration. I watched a 60 Minutes special, I think it was two weeks ago, on a German soccer team, Dorf or something like that. Is there a German team like that? Come on, so, are, are there any? Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you. Sorry, I'd be offended. I didn't get it quite right. <laughs> right. All right, and they're in the stadium playing this uh, pitch, right? That's what they call it, a pitch, right? And they have a white ball and they kick it, right? It's a different form of football, right? It's called soccer. <laughs> All right? And Greg, the entire audience is all wearing yellow. I'm like the whole stadium. And there's unity in the fact, this is the color you wear. When you show up on our, in our stadium, you, all, you wear yellow. I mean, everybody knows that's the color you wear. And so the stands are just packed. And you can tell these folks are serious about their soccer. They're serious about it. In other words, they are completely unified in their soccer. They are of one mind. This is what we do. And the, the, the player was describing it's that American kid from Pennsylvania. Um, uh, none of you know? Come on, soccer fans. The young boy from Pennsylvania. Christian, Christian, Christian what's his last name? Olsen. Yes, thank you. Right. He was playing for them. And he was talking about in the 60 Minutes interview how the stands, you could actually feel on the field the vibration that the participants are creating in the stadium, that it actually trembles onto the soccer field. And they were asking him, what was it like to go out there that first game and play there? And the whole works. He's describing an experience and being part of a group that's unified behind a team, behind a sport. And what I'm trying to tell you is that we're supposed to have so much unity in the body of Christ that when an unbeliever comes in there, they go, there's something different about that place. Amen. I ain't been to a church like that before. Those folks are serious about their Lord, their God, their Savior, their worship, the Word of God. In other words, go back to Philippians chapter number 2. Quickly, quickly, quickly. We never have enough time. He says very clearly, let them be, <laughs> be like-minded same love, one accord, one mind. That's where we want to get to. That's where we want to be. We want to be completely united. So Jesus prays for the unity of the church so that the world will know that there is a God in heaven who sent his son to the earth as the most marvelous, glorious demonstration of love ever presented in the history of humanity. And then he says in verse number three, let nothing, let nothing, let nothing, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Don't let anything happen in the body of Christ through selfish ambition or conceit or anything like that. Don't let a singer sing behind the pulpit. Don't let a person get a microphone. Don't let someone play on an instrument if they're not doing it for the glory of God. If it's about them, if they have an agenda, if they're here to showcase their talents for their own personal agenda, don't give them a Sunday school class. Don't give them a microphone. Don't give them a platform to advance their own agenda. In other words, check your motives. Check your motives. Let nothing be done. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Don't do anything. Why am I doing this? And it needs to be, I'm doing it to bring glory to God. I'm doing it to serve others. It's actually not about me. Finish the verse with me. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Let each count others more important than ourselves. God forbid, God forbid that we ever bump somebody out of our seat. Hey, buddy, I need you. You're sitting in my seat. <laughs> That'll happen sometimes around here. You'll come in late, and a visitor will have got your seat. You're sitting in somebody's seat. I'm sorry, but I'll tell you what. 
Wouldn't want to be you. Just kidding. Just kidding. Okay? All right, that's a little tiny thing to have some fun with. That's just a little fun thing right there. But on a very serious note, it's not about us. It's not about us. It's about others. Others are more important. So, for example, something as simple as giving up my spot in Sunday school so I can greet. In other words, I'll give up my Sunday school hour, and yes, I'll miss a great discussion. And yes, I'll miss the, t- miss the teaching and the fellowship and all of Sunday school. And yes, it'll actually get boring out here on my post-greeting. But it's not about me, it's about others. And I want to make sure that when someone comes to the door, all of you incredible volunteers, 200 plus volunteers for our nursery, thank you. You give up your worship time. You give up the preaching hour. You go somewhere else and you take care of somebody's children. And the reason you're doing it is because it's not about you. It's not about you. You're counting others more significant than yourselves. Those little four-year-olds are more important than yourselves. So yourselves and others. What do you mean yourselves and others? Look at verse number four. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also. The word also there shows me that not only do I need to look to my other, myself, but I can look to others. The word also there. If it wasn't also, then it would be only look to others. But wait a minute. There's a reason he says that. Because if I don't take care of myself, I can't help others. So here's some basic ideas for you right here. What are the self-interests that you, might, that you must look to in order to be able to help others? Well, first of all, it's your health. You got to take care of yourself, folks. Why? Why do I need to take care of myself so you can help others? You got to make sure you have a place to shelter so you can help others. You got to take care of your own marriage. You cannot let the church destroy your marriage. We're out sowing and doing this, doing this, 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 to the point where your marriage is falling apart. No, look to your own marriage. Do not allow something to destroy from the church your own marriage. So yes, you are to look to others. Absolutely look to others, but don't forget that you need to look to your own things. In other words, your own wife, your own children, your own health, your own self uh, shelter, your own finances, but not to the exclusion of others, but in conjunction with it or in, in an appropriate balance is what he's trying to communicate there. Verse number five. So then he says, let this mind be in you. What mind, what mindset do you want me to have? What perspective do you want to have? What attitude do you want me to have? How should I think? Let this mind be in you. What kind of a mind should I have? Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Now, oftentimes we don't make things relevant. Unfortunately, we don't make things relevant enough. So you're a teenager sitting here with me this morning and you're just about bored out of your mind, and you're struggling with what in the world is he talking about. I need you to understand that this morning, if you are a volleyball player, if you play volleyball, if you play volleyball, if you play volleyball, this lesson is incredibly, incredibly applicable to you. If you're a volleyball player. If you're a baseball player, you play baseball, you enjoy the game of baseball. Man, I am such a baseball player. This lesson is for you. If you're an 11 Bravo and you're on A team or B team, you're in an infantry nine-man squad. This lesson is for you. This lesson is for you. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now let's unpack that so that we can make it relevant. Verse number 6. Now remember, he's teaching us a mindset that he wants us to have. We're learning a mindset. How should I think this morning? What should my perspective be? He's going to give us exhibit A, Jesus Christ. Verse 6, who being in the form of God. That is, Paul is communicating that Jesus had every bit of the essence that God had. Whatever the essence is of God, and I'm not saying that flippantly. I'm saying it from the perspective is I don't know what the essence of God is. I know what the essence of me is. I'm carbon. I'm dust. I'm molecules. I'm atoms. That's what we are in our basic fundamental Whatever the essence of God is, whatever that is, 
Not only does God the Father have it, but all of that essence, whatever that is, God the Son has it as well. That there is no difference in the essence of God the Father and the essence of God the Son. Both are, say it loud church, God. God the Father, God the Son. Both are God. Having the same what? Essence. Not the same function. Not the same function, but the same essence. So now in your King James Bible, you read in the rest of that verse, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The ESV transfers it something that he didn't have to hold on to, didn't have to grasp. So imagine for just a moment, let's just set up this as a way of illustration. Let us communicate just for a moment by way of illustration that within this body, uh, bottle of water, this is the Dasani water, that this is the essence of God. This is the essence of God right here. And I have my hand on this bottle. I have my hand gripping this bottle. I am not going to let this bottle go. You understand that? I'm not going to let it go. I'm holding it. I'm grasping it. This is what our text is communicating, that Jesus let it go. He let go of it. He did not need to stay in heaven and retain what he had in heaven. Okay. Uh, let's push the uh, uh, illustration a little bit more, Adam. Now, where is Adam? He's normally right here. Adam, where are you? Come back to the worship service if you can hear me. All right. So imagine for a moment that in order for Jesus to leave heaven and take on human flesh, this is the one thing that's holding him in heaven. What does he have to do to, in order to come on this earth? He has to let go of it. He has to let go of it. Our text is communicating he let go of it. He let go of it. He no longer grasped it. Now he's going to unpack for us what he means by that. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to made equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. No reputation. No reputation. What are we talking about there? No reputation. The ESV renders it, he emptied himself. He emptied himself. The Greek word behind here is K-E-N-O. We call it, um, here it is on the screen for you, kenosis. Write this down in your Bible if you write on the margin. This is kenosis. This is the term that communicates the emptying of himself. Now let's all be clear. He did not give up his divinity. At no point was he less than God. We're not saying that in any way, shape, or form. He did not set aside divine attributes that made him God, and then he no longer possessed him. So whatever he gave up, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment, it did not make him less than God. How do we know this? Matthew tells us, Emmanuel, or what? God with us. So was God walking on the planet? The answer is yes. Jesus is the walking, talking, living, breathing God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of the only begotten Son of God. So we saw the Son of God, not we personally, but those on the earth. So whatever he gave up, we'll talk about it in a minute, it did not detract from him being the Son of God. He was still the Son of God. But he did, he did let go, he did let go of stuff. He did let go of it. I'll give you a few things. Number one, the ongoing worship in heaven. The ongoing angelic worship in heaven. When he was on the planet as the walking, talking, living, breathing Son of God, he was not surrounded by angels 24 hours a day in a company that were constantly worshiping him. He gave that up. Did he have that before? Yes, he had that in heaven. At the throne of God, there's continually angels that declare who he is. Isaiah tells us, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. That was given up. He let go of that. On the earth, he was separated from the angelic majesty. Number two, immunity from pain and suffering. Prior to his incarnation, he never had a headache. Prior to his incarnation, he never experienced diarrhea. Prior to his incarnation, he never had a stomach ailment. Prior to his incarnation, he never had a cold. Prior to his incarnation, he'd never have a headache. 
in order to take on human flesh, he had to be willing to give up all the immunity that God has from pain and suffering. Let me give you an illustration. Is God thirsty? No. Was Jesus thirsty on the cross? Yes. He had never experienced thirst until he came on this earth. So he gave up immunity from hunger. He gave up immunity from thirst. He gave up immunity from a headache. He gave up. So the, what did he give up? Not his divine attributes. Not his divine attributes. But certainly he gave up much. He gave up intimacy and fellowship with the Godhead. This is easy to illustrate in our church. This is easy to illustrate. If you're a soldier and you've ever been deployed and you're married, you're going to completely understand what I'm talking about. And there's lots of you in this room. Raise your hand if you've been deployed from your wife. Husbands or wives, either one of you. Raise your hand. You raise your hand. Come on, come on. Come on, get a few more up. Participate. Thank you. All right. Every day you enjoy intimacy with your wife. Every day you enjoy intimacy with your spouse. You see them. You go to bed together. You get up in the morning. You have coffee together. You enjoy meals together. And you enjoy the intimacy of being married and seeing each other every day, sharing a bedroom, sharing life, all the day-to-day -day interaction, holding hands, going to movies together. And suddenly the army deploys you to Timbuktu, and you are now what? Separated. Now you do, do you still communicate? Sure you still communicate, but it's not the, it's not the what, church? It's not the same. And Jesus gave up the intimacy that he had with the Father when he took on human flesh. Did he still talk to the Father? Yes. Did he still pray to him? Yes. But was it the same? The answer is no. He's on earth and he's in heaven and they're not together. They don't have the same intimacy. I think that's the third thing. I have two more for you. Number four, he gave up the in independent use of his attributes. As you read, as you read the Gospels, you will continually see that I'm doing the will of my Father. Doing, I'm doing the will of what the Father sent me. He sent me. I'm saying what He told me to say. I'm doing what He told me to do. Where are you going? Where the Holy Spirit leads me. Why are you doing that? Because the Holy Spirit anointed me to preach the Gospel. So He no longer functions independently. He functions under the subordination of God the Father, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Number five, and we're done. He gave up divine appearance. He had a unique appearance prior to his incarnation, and he gave that up. How do we know that? In John 17, Jesus prays that the disciples will see the glory he had before the incarnation. His appearance actually changes. Isaiah 53 tells us, when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, if Jesus was sitting in our assembly, I'm talking about during the first century, we would look, oh, that's obviously the Son of God. He looked like any other human being. Same color skin, same color hair, and all that. Prior to that, in heaven, we would see, oh, that's the Son of God. So he gave up that divine appearance to come on this earth. And why did he do that? Why did he do that? Well, the Bible tells us who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him, underline these words, the form of a servant. The Greek word there is doulos, doulos. In fact, we're now at the point where Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday are all come crashing in an intersection for us. All of them, all of them. Because on Sunday night, we've been studying Moses, who is the servant of God, and he's seeking his people to leave Egypt so they can go serve God in the wilderness. And on Wednesday night, we got our first week of introduction to the book of James, who is a servant of, say it loud, church, God, a servant of God. And suddenly we realize that the ultimate example of service is our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant. Hey, would you like to know the secret of an amazing marriage? Start serving each other. Stop being the most important person in the marriage. Look to the needs of each other more than yourselves. That'll fix your marriage. I mean, that'll fix your marriage right there. When you're no longer the single most important person in your marriage, when the needs of your spouse are more important than your needs, when you start serving each other, that'll fix your marriage. I don't need to write a book. 
That's like 400 words, and your marriage is fixed. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating when I tell you this. If there's ever a problem in your marriage, ask yourself, am I serving my spouse? If there's ever an issue in your marriage, ask yourself, am I the most important person in the marriage right now? Because I promise you, back the issue up. Just back it up. Just back it up. Okay? What do you mean? Let's be real confrontational right now. Every single adulterous relationship always, always, always has as root, I'm more important than them. Because if she was more important, if he was more important, you'd stay faithful. The reason you're having an affair is because seeing your own needs gratified is more important than remaining faithful to your spouse. In other words, taking on the form of a servant works in marriage. And oh, by the way, this is a two-way street. I'm the head of the house. All right, you're the head of the house. Be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. Take on the form of a servant. Take on the form of a servant. All right, I want us to close by running over to John 13. So run with me, please, to John 13. Fourth gospel. Fourth gospel. Fourth gospel. John 13. John 13. We're going to be done because this is Jesus serving. And so that's why we're running here because he took on the form of a servant. And I want you to show you Jesus serving. John 13, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour was come in verse 1 of chapter 13. Having departed, should depart out of this world unto the Father. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them even to the end. And after supper being ended, the devil having now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing the Father had given him all things in his hand, and that he was come from God, went to God. He rises from supper. Please notice these words. This is so good. And laid aside his garments. He laid aside his garments. He laid aside his garment. Imagine for just a moment, by way of illustration, that this outer garment, this outer garment represents everything that Jesus gave up to come to this earth. He emptied himself. What do we call this? The kenosis. So he has this outer garment on. He has this outer garment on. And in order to take on human flesh and come to the earth, he has to give up this outer garment, just like he had to lay aside his garment. Follow this illustration. So Jesus did not, did not hold on to the garment. He didn't grasp it. He didn't, no, you're not taking this off me. This is mine. Instead, what did he do? He laid it, what? Aside. This garment represents everything that you're going to have to lay aside to become a servant. For example, if you are an arrogant person, you're never going to be perceived as a servant. So lay aside your arrogancy. All right? Let's change it. Maybe you're not an arrogant person. Maybe that's not you at all. Let's change it. If you're an apathetic person, an apathetic person, that means you don't care about anything. You don't have a care. Because people who serve, they what? They care. They care. Why are you serving? Because I care. So you may not have to give up arrogancy. You may have to give up apathy. But in either case, in order to truly become a servant, you're going to have to give something up. He laid it aside. What I'm trying to tell you this morning is that this little chapter 13 is a micro picture of the macro picture of Jesus laying aside his garments. But wait a minute. It doesn't stop. And then he took on, he took on a what? He took on a towel. So Jesus took on human flesh. Mm. And why did he do this? So that he could wash the disciples' feet. Then cometh to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And he says, what I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And Peter says, you would never wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. To which Peter's like me, give me a bath then, God. Wash my whole body. I mean, come on, I'm all in. I'm all in. Whole hog. Verse 13. 
You call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Verse 15, for I have given you an example. Taking on the form of a servant, not holding on to the outer garment that keeps me from serving. Letting it go. Letting it go. Letting it go. So many leaders think that if they start serving, their people won't respect them. It's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. I can tell you in 20 years of an army career, whenever I saw an officer, commissioned or non-commissioned, serving, I had more respect for them. Not less respect. More respect. you got to let it go. Volleyball players, if you're the most important person on the court, if you have to get every shot, if you have to make every block, if it's all about you, your team will never achieve the victory that it could if you get unified. Is there six volleyball players? Is that right, Teresa? Six? If you could get six girls thinking of others more than themselves, completely like-minded on a court, you could virtually destroy other teams. And by the way, all you infantry guys, you know full well that when you have Alpha Team and Bravo Team and you get four infantry men working together under the direction of a squad leader and four more under the direction of a squad leader and both are listening to their team leaders and you get them working well on any 7-8 battle drill military guys, you know what I'm talking about. It is a thing to behold. Like you sports folks looking at a volleyball team that's working well, or a basketball like Jeff Woosley looking at a basketball, five guys on a squad working well together. Is it five? All right, good. I got it right. All right. Working together well, it is a thing to behold. I'm trying to tell you that if you could get an entire church thinking, I'm not the most important church member. I'm here to serve our Lord. I'm submitting to his leadership. It is a thing to, say it, church, it's a thing to behold. It's a thing to behold. And so he gives us, he gives us, I'm going to run to my last slide. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. He says, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If the Lord Jesus Christ would give up all that he had and take on the form of a servant, why is Sean Harris having a hard time not doing the exact same thing? Every husband in the room this morning, be the number one servant in the house. Be the number one servant. You serve your children, you serve your wife. Just lead in an amazing way in a life of service. First sergeants, battalion commanders, small business owners, general managers, plant managers, teachers, cover all my bases, athletes. Start serving others. Take on the form of a servant and make others a priority. And then he says, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So here's the bottom line. If our master and Lord became a servant, how much more should I see myself as a servant? And so who are we today? We are servants and we are messengers. We are servants and we are messengers. Grant, we live to serve others, our God and others. Kaiser, we have a simple message. It goes something like this. There is a God in heaven who loved you so much He sent His only begotten Son to die in your place so that your sins could be forgiven and you could be granted eternal life through faith in that message. That's the gospel. It's 30 seconds. Don't make it harder than it is. It's that simple message. Let's pray. God, help me to be a a servant this week. Would you pray that with me? God, help me to be a servant this week. God, help me to be a servant this week. God, help me. Holy Spirit of living God, empower me to serve others. Help me to follow the example of my Lord and Savior who took on the form of a servant, a doulos, a slave, so that he could serve others. 
Help me to stop living for myself and esteem my wife, my son, my daughter more important than myself. Help me to capture the essence of being a servant. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.